All right, well, um, today it's me, I guess, to do the intro um, because uh, our usual intro introducer is actually giving the talk today. So, yeah, Tim Tim Butsworth is going to tell us about uh, continue where Max uh, left off about these preserved uh, curvature conditions. So, thanks, Tim. Well, thanks very much for that, Paul. And hello again, everyone. It's good to have you all here for another another seminar. So, you may recall that. Uh, in, in this season, this current iteration of the seminar series, we're quite interested in the Ricci flow. So uh, the Ricci flow, a uh, solution to the Ricci flow, it's a one parameter family of Ramanian metrics G, uh, depending smoothly on its time parameter. And it's going to be evolving according to this equation here, minus twice, uh, the, the, the metric is going to be changing according to minus twice its own Ricci curvature. Now, this, uh, this is a geometric partial differential equation. And through works we've seen previously in a couple of talks, we've seen that solutions of the Ricci flow tend to develop, sing well, at least on compact manifolds, solutions of the Ricci flow tend to develop singularities in a finite amount of time. And with geometrical and topological applications in mind, we really want to get a handle on what these singularities actually look like. The, the long-term goal, I suppose, is if we can understand uh, what, what these singularities look like, that gives us a lot of good information about what the original manifold look, look, looks like. We might not a priori know what the topology of the manifold is, but understanding these singularities might allow us to do that. And it might even allow us to, to continue the flow past this singularity. You couldn't hope to uh, flow through a singularity without having any information about what it actually looks like. So in order to get a handle uh, on, on these singularities, like with any geometric partial differential equation, the idea is to produce a number of key quantities that describe enough about the geometry of the Ricci flow, but also things that you can simultaneously control along the flow. And this is what we're going to be, well, we're going to be having a look at some of these quantities today. So usually, I guess the, the basic thing to try would just be to come up with a quantity and try and bound it with the maximum principle. There is some subtleties here though, because the, the, the basic scalar maximum principle might not be useful because we want, to, we want to control quantities that aren't nicely presented as scalars. And so we need some more machinery. That would be the tensor maximum principle. And this is what Max talked about uh, the last few talks. So let me remind you uh, where we were up to. I suppose that when it comes to intrinsic geometric flows, getting a good handle on the Riemann curvature operator is probably the best thing you can do. Uh, the, the Riemann curvature operator, which I'm going to be noting with this MathCal R here, it basically contains all of the information, all of the geometric information we could possibly want, uh, roughly speaking. <laughs> Now, given that is the case, given that the Riemann curvature operator is such an important operator to get a handle on, it'd be sensible to write an evolution equation for the Riemann curvature. So usually what that would look like, you would pick a coordinate system, you'd uh, find the time derivative of the Riemann curvature, since you can express the Riemann curvature in terms of the components of the metric, and you can, you can use the chain rule to get an expression for the evolution of the Riemann curvature. But that expression is not very good. Um, and the way around this is what, what, what we've seen a couple of times now, I think, which was the Uhlenbeck trick. Basically, what, what I understand the Uhlenbeck trick to be is that you don't just fix a coordinate system. You actually allow your coordinate system to change as you're evolving and, and so that you're so that your coordinate system is preserving nice structure with, uh, associated with the Riemann curvature. And so when you do that, you get this nice expression for the Riemann curvature uh, operator here, namely that the, the Riemann curvature evolves according to a diffusion term, diffusion taken with respect to the Riemannian metric, the squared of the Riemann curvature, because remember we can interpret the Riemann curvature as a self-adjoint map uh, that takes you from two vectors to two vectors. And this other interesting term here, which is the Lie algebra square uh, of this of this Riemann curvature operator. It is a square, so this, this basically has the same scaling law as this term here. Okay, so 
I suppose what we're, what, what we're going to aim to do today is look at this equation, uh, work out what it can tell us about the original solutions of the Ricci flow in three dimensions. So why, why three dimensions? Well, there's nothing to study in one dimension. There's no such thing as intrinsic curvature in one dimension. In two dimension, we didn't do it in great detail, but there were some comments that Max made about the, uh, the Ricci flow on surfaces. And maybe that's something we can look at in a bit more detail later. But of greatest interest to us this morning will be the evolution for three-dimensional manifolds. So what is quite fortunate for us is that three-dimensional manifolds are exactly the subject of the Poincaré conjecture. So hopefully by studying enough three-dimensional Ricci flow, we can get a good handle on the topology of three-dimensional manifolds. Okay. So what does the Riemann curvature look like in three dimensions? Well, you can always diagonalize the Riemann curvature. Uh, let, let's say its eigenvalues are lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. In dimension three, it's, it's pretty straightforward to get a handle on what the, uh, what the uh, Lie bracket square of an operator is. It basically just spits out all of these cross terms here. And so therefore we get this nice expression for uh, R squared, plus R, R hash. So why is this important? Well, you, you may recall that, well, let, let's just uh, back up for just a second. Roughly speaking, what the tensor maximum principle tells us is that in order to get a good handle on what solutions of this equation are doing, it suffices to get a good handle on what solutions of this equation is doing. Being a bit more careful about that, this doesn't have this is just algebraically related to R. And so this is actually an ODE. And the tensor maximum principle says that if we can find some good uh, properties that are preserved under this ODE, then the same is going to be true for the more general PDE, provided that the conditions we're interested in are convex. You absolutely do need convexity because this diffusion term uh, will, will, will cause problems otherwise. Okay, and so what that means is that in order to get a good handle on Ricci flow in three dimensions, it really suffices to get a good handle on solutions of, this, uh, of, of these three ODEs here. Now, uh, the, these ODEs are quite nice. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll go on to make some, some studies, uh, some good observations about behaviors of these ODEs in a second. But before I do that, I'll also just point out that with the Riemann curvature given by this, uh, the, the Ricci curvature eigenvalue is just found by summing up, summing up pairs. And if we assume that lambda one, lambda two, lambda three are increasing, then the Ricci curvature eigenvalues in increasing order are lambda one plus lambda two, lambda one plus lambda three, and then lambda two plus lambda three. So if we make the convention that lambda one is the smallest Riemann curvature eigenvalue and lambda two is the second smallest, then lambda one plus lambda two is going to be the smallest Ricci curvature eigenvalue. Okay, now let's get in uh, to the study. Sorry, of the Tim. Yeah. Uh, so you mean smallest initially, or is this preserved by the ODE? Uh, I, well, it, uh, so you can, you can have, um, so what we're going to do as we're going through the ODE, uh, we're going to allow ourselves to change, uh, what, uh -huh. so let, uh, Lambda one is defined to be the, the, the smallest eigenvalue and Lambda two is defined to be the, mm -hmm. Lambda two is defined to be the, the, the second smallest always. And so one subtlety that we're, we are going to have to address is the fact that you know, this, the, the basis that diagonalizes this thing is going to possibly change as, as yeah. we evolve. So, so maybe maybe the, the correct thing to do is to say lambda one equals, you know, min, the minimum eigenvalue of yeah. R. So that, that, that's what we're going to do here. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Okay, now these, these ODs were actually treated by, by Max a couple of weeks ago, in particular, he used, he, we've already seen applications of the tensor maximum principle. He used the tensor maximum principle to show that non-negative Ricci curvature is preserved. So for example, if lambda one plus lambda two is greater than or equal to zero, 
then the same is always going to be true uh, as you go through your Ricci flow. He also looked at Hamilton Ivy pinching. Now it's, it's a slightly technical statement, but uh, my best interpretation of what Hamilton Ivy pinching says is that if you do happen to have negative Riemann curvature, it's not going to cause you many issues. Negative Riemann curvature is always going to be dominated by positive, uh, positive Riemann curvature if the negative curvature gets large. So as you go through the Ricci flow, as you get close to a singularity, you might be worried about having negative eigenvalues of the Riemann curvature. Hamilton Ivy pinching tells you that in the three-dimensional case, if you do get very large, uh, if you do get very large negative Riemann curvature, that'll always be offset by even larger positive Riemann curvature. Okay, so before getting into the, the really hard, hard uh, analysis, well, it's not that hard, but before getting into the analysis, I thought I'd briefly take you through uh, some, some numerics. So what, what you may notice about this system of ODEs here is that the, the right-hand side is, is a homogeneous second-order polynomial. So that means that there, this, these, uh, this system of ODEs has a nice scale invariance. If you scale time and scale your lambda functions appropriately, you're going to have a scale invariance and you can take one solution and map it into another solution. Now, what that means is that, well, I claim that it therefore suffices uh, to consider this this renormalized uh, this renormalized equation here. So if this was our original equation, we chuck in this extra term here, and that the point of this adding in this extra term is that now uh, the norm the norm of the solutions of this ODE are actually are actually preserved. And you may, might think, well, this is this is a completely different equation. Why would we care about that? Well, first of all, it's it's easier to well, I guess it's easier to study solutions of this particular equation if you know they're preserved to the sphere because, well, numerically at least, you know that solutions of this equation are going to blow up because you've got this lambda squared term there. And when things blow up, they become a bit difficult to handle numerically. For example, MATLAB will tell you that you get some, uh, that the numbers you're getting are too big to give a sensible answer. So instead you can rescale and because of the scaling invariance of this property, you can uniquely use the term. Uh, if you have a solution of this equation here, you can always uniquely rescale it to work out what the original solution was. And so I did some numerics here. Uh, this was about 200 randomly chosen initial conditions on the sphere. And we want to see how, uh, how these evolve. So that this might look like a bit of a mess here. But what I want to point out to you is this critical point here. You may notice that a lot of the trajectories are actually tending towards this particular point here. This point has lambda one equals lambda two equals lambda three. And that means that all of the, that means all of the eigenvalues of the Riemann curvature are the same. Geometrically, this is the constant sectional curvature case. And so he ends up with the sphere. So what I want to do today is more or less make precise what I mean when I say that most of the trajectories tend to this particular point here. Now, you might ask, what, what does Hamilton Ivy pinching have to do here? Well, Hamilton Ivy pinching really makes, much, makes most sense if you, if you know you have some negative curvature. Hamilton Ivy pinching says that negative curvature is dominated by positive curvature. And so even though you, it's sort of difficult to see here, Hamilton IV pinching, as I understand it, is reflected in the existence of critical points. That, that there are other critical points here that are not, uh, that are not all positive. Uh, there are other critical points here that solutions tend towards that have some of the lambdas positive, but others zero. And this is precisely what Hamilton IV pinching says. It says that in the limits, you're going to have non-negative curvature. But the focus for today's talk is going to be the setting that uh, the, the situation in which we already know, we already know that we've got positive curvature, because if we already, if we start with positive curvature, the hope is that we're going to be tending towards this critical point here. Okay. Let's get into it. So there are certainly lots of good resources available for this sort of material. 
I, I actually tend to prefer uh, using using topic toppings lectures on, on Ricci flow for this sort of thing. I, I find it quite comforting reading through topping because it's quite I, I find it quite easy to understand, quite succinct, and and yet it still simultaneously seems to cover a lot of good information. So th this was my preference, and so basically all the proofs I'm taking come uh, from for the rest of this talk from now. Most of the proofs I'm going to be showing you came from that, that particular work. So how do we do this? We've got our system of ODEs. We know we have the tensor maximum principle. So what we need to do is find useful quantities that are preserved under this ODE. But remember, that's not quite enough. We also have to make sure that these quantities are convex. We need convexity because otherwise we'll run into problems when we introduce that diffusion term. Once they're convex and once they're preserved under this ODE, we do get to apply the tensor maximum principle. So that, that's quite nice. Okay, so what, what, might, what might these quantities look like? It might be great to naively take just the eigenvalues. Uh, so for example, can we just take the smallest eigenvalue and say it's greater than or equal to zero? What about the second smallest? Well, there are problems here because these eigenvalues aren't just by themselves, that they're, they're part of a matrix. And simply selecting an eigenvalue from a matrix, that, that might not be such a, good, uh, such a great function. How do we remedy that? Well, I guess the first thing, the first thing, the, the first question we need to ask is if we do simply select an eigenvalue from a matrix, or well, more, more precisely, if we consider the function that takes as input a matrix and as output uh, one of its eigenvalues, is that function actually going to be convex? In general, the answer is no, but the answer becomes yes if the eigenvalue you're selecting happens to be the smallest or the biggest eigenvalue. So this is going to be the first result that we cover today that's going to be quite useful going forwards. Let f be the function that takes as input a symmetric n by n matrix. And as output, it, it, send, it, it sends such a matrix to the smallest eigenvalue. This function is going to be continuous. It's not going to be differentiable. But even though it's not differentiable, it still happens to be a concave function. And of course, by taking minuses of everything, you get a similar statement in reverse. If you take the function which records the largest eigenvalue, that function is going to be a convex function. So this is quite useful. And the, the, the proof, proof is fairly straightforward. So re remember what it means for something to, be, uh, something to be concave or convex. You have to take as input, you have to put this, this expression here into the function and relate that to uh, f of this and f of this. So how do we do it? Let's take uh, two symmetric matrices, let's call them A and B. And I'm going to consider uh, this line of symmetric matrices, which goes from A to B. Now, for a given S, let E uh, be a unit norm vector for the smallest eigenvalue. So we know that because it's a symmetric matrix, it's definitely definitely going to have uh, all real eigenvalues. And in particular, it's definitely going to have a smallest eigenvalue with a non-trivial eigenspace. Just pick one of those eigenvalues uh, and rescale so that it has a unit norm. So what do we do? Well, remember what we're trying to do is say, well, this is the inequality we want uh, in order to get concavity. How does this go? Well, just literally by definition, we have that f, because remember f takes the smallest eigenvalue. By definition, uh, the, the smallest eigenvalue is just the, the number that you get when you take the inner product of this, uh, this, this matrix applied to that vector with that same vector. By linearity, we get s and one minus s out. Now this is where we can, th this is where we really need to use the facts that the eigenvalue we're dealing with is the smallest. This argument breaks down otherwise, because this is the smallest, uh, eigenvalue, we know it's greater than or equal to the smallest eigenvalue uh, of just A by itself. So this is just S, uh, the inner product of AE with E. So certainly this is going to be smaller than 
what, what you get when you take the smallest possible choice. And the same is true over here. But this is just another way of characterizing the smallest eigenvalue. The smallest eigenvalue of this matrix A is simply uh, the, the smallest you can make this expression when you're allowing E to range over unit norm eigenvectors. And the same is true over here. So you get this expression. And of course, this is enough to conclude that this function is concave. Simply by sticking minus signs everywhere, you get the same argument uh, to show, well, the same argument also shows that the largest eigenvalue is going to be a convex function. Okay, so this is quite good, <laughs> especially in three dimensions. In three dimensions, this is very good because it means that, well, let's, let's take a symmetric three by three matrix and let's say lambda one, lambda two, lambda three uh, are, its, are its eigenvalues in increasing order. Maybe a, a slightly more high powered way of saying the same thing is that lambda one is a function that goes from, well, actually all of these functions are going to be going from symmetric three by three matrices and they're going to put you into R. Lambda one is the function that records the smallest eigenvalue Lambda three is the function that records the largest eigenvalue and lambda two is the one that gets the, the other one. Okay, so that, that's how we're going to think of lambda one, lambda two and lambda three. Now we know that lambda one, uh, wait, I've gotten mixed up. Lambda one is concave, lambda three is convex. And so that means lambda three is convex and minus lambda one is convex. So that means the sum of those two things is also convex. And we also know that the smallest one, uh, sorry, we know that lambda one plus lambda two plus lambda three, the function which records the, the sum of all of them, well, the sum of all the eigenvalues is precisely the trace. This is actually a linear function, linear function from the symmetric three by three matrices into R. And so that means this is both concave and convex. And so in particular, if we add or subtract this trace expression from a function that's concave, we're still going to get something that's concave. And if we add or subtract this trace to something which is convex, then the result is still going to be convex. So this is great because it means that the sum of the two smallest eigenvalues is going to be concave. And the difference, that the largest difference of the eigenvalues is going to be convex. This is great because lambda one plus lambda two, well, remember this is precisely the smallest eigenvalue of the Ricci curvature. Okay, so let's, let's get into uh, establishing uh, some applications of, of, this, of this result. Our first result is a slight upgrade of one that we've already seen. So Max showed us uh, a couple of weeks ago that non-negative Ricci curvature is preserved. This statement here is going one step further. It's saying, well, if we quantify the non-negativity of the Ricci curvature with this number beta here, then we also, then this result is saying that if the Ricci curvature is bigger than beta, then it will continue, uh, it will continue to do that. It, it will continue to be that way. The preservation of non-negative Ricci curvature is this result with beta equals zero. Okay, so the way we're going to quantify this is with the function psi one is equal to beta minus lambda one minus lambda two. So remember, I said that lambda one plus lambda two is concave, which means that this function is a convex function, which means that insisting that psi one is less than or equal to zero is a convex condition. So that part of the lemma I think is fairly obvious. What perhaps is not so obvious is the fact that lambda one minus lambda two being bigger than beta is actually a condition that, that is preserved under the ODEs. So let's have a look at that. The first, the first observation that you have to be a bit careful about is this one here. You, you, you can't just simply bash this into the ODE and hope everything works out. First, you have to realize that because psi one is less than or equal to zero, that implies that lambda one plus lambda two uh, is greater than or equal to beta, which we said was greater than or equal to zero. So the sum of the two smallest eigenvalues is greater than or equal to zero. 
that implies immediately that lambda three, which is the largest eigenvalue also has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now we can just do our computation. Uh, this is fairly straightforward. Lambda one squared plus lambda two squared plus lambda three times lambda one plus lambda two. Since beta is greater than or equal to zero, this expression is also greater than or equal to zero. So we get that this expression is always, well, it, it, it's non-decreasing, which means that this will stay less than or equal to zero provided it starts that way. Okay, so that's the proof, fairly simple that one. That one, excuse me, that one was fairly simple. Uh, we're going to make things a bit harder now. So we'll, we'll just treat it as a warm up for the moment. But uh, let's just take a pause for a second and, and I'll, I'll recall for you why, why this is useful. Lambda one plus lambda two is the smallest eigenvalue of the Ricci curvature. And so geometrically, we're now able to use the tensor maximum principle to, to, uh, to prove that if the Ricci curvature is greater than or equal to beta, then it's going to stay that way for all future times. We're not going to lose this positivity of the Ricci curvature. So that, that's, well, that's a good start, but we, we have further to go. Maybe I'll break at this point and see if there are any questions before things start getting quite technical. Uh, yeah, just a quick one. Um, so I um, seem to recall there being some kind of ON invariance required to apply the maximum principle, or am I, am I misremembering something? Yes, yes, you do need ON invariance, but I think it's pretty clear that we, well, uh, ON invariance, if you take a symmetric matrix and apply an ON action to it, you still get the same eigenvalues. So I think it's pretty clear that, well, the, these conditions, not only are they convex, but they're also ON invariant as well. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's clear. I just wanted to make sure that that's what we needed. Um, yeah, no, you are yeah. right. I guess I was being a bit careless with my application oh, of the... <laughs> that's cool. There, there was yeah, also, cool. you know, invariance under parallel transport, but I think that one's pretty clear as well. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that's something I should look at at some point later. Interesting, thanks. Okay. So the next one, we're going to introduce a psi two function and psi three, uh, and a psi three function, which can be used to, to, well, to keep track of useful geometric quantities. Now, the good news is that because psi one is less than, because we know that psi one is a convex condition that's less than or equal to zero, when proving all of our future results, we're allowed to assume when showing preservation under the ODE that psi one is less than or equal to zero. And so with that in mind, let's, let's fix a beta, beta greater than or equal to zero, the, the same beta that, was, that we had from before. And now, <coughs> Now we're going to have a look at what we're going to pick, going to pick an epsilon uh, between zero and one third. And we're going to have a look at the quantity psi two, which is equal to delta, uh, delta lambda three minus lambda one minus lambda two. And we're going to set delta equals to two epsilon on one minus two epsilon. And we're going to look at the condition psi one comma psi two is less than or equal to zero. Now, I, I have a question for the audience before we move on, see if you can work this out. Why is it so important for this computation that delta is between zero and two? Why would I not really want delta to be any, any larger than that? Uh, equivalently, why do you think I need epsilon to be between zero and a third here? Any ideas why that would be the case? What, did I just pull this number out from nowhere or is there something more, more deep going on here? I mean, if delta is 1,000, then phi 2 is not going to be negative, right? Uh, phi, psi 2 is not going to be negative. Well, I mean, <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, is, I guess, is the, the answer to that. Um, it, it all comes down to do with the fact that I'm, I'm suggesting that lambda 1 uh, and lambda 2, lambda 3 have this particular order. If I set, for example, delta equals 2, then saying that two lambda three minus lambda one minus lambda two is less than or equal to zero, well, that's, 
that's not a very interesting condition because that implies that all three of these eigenvalues are the same. And so this is where this is where delta being between zero and two become comes in handy. Otherwise, this condition doesn't really make any sense. So I just thought I'd point that out before moving on. Okay. So how does the proof of this result go? Well, let's let's have a look at the evolution. Uh, let, let's have a look at the evolution of this quantity. So, so just, just recall that lambda one dot is given, well, let, let's just do this for all three of them. Lambda i dot is given by lambda i squared plus lambda j, lambda k. Uh, j is not equal to k, is not equal to i. <coughs> so these, these are the equations that we're dealing with here. And so we just sub substitute these into the, the expression for the evolution of psi two. What we're going to get is delta times lambda three dot minus uh, the sum of lambda one dot plus lambda two dot. And this is the same expression we had before. And what I'm going to observe here is that it suffices to show that this expression is non-positive. In fact, even more than that, it suffices to show that this expression is non-positive with the assumption that psi one is less than or equal to zero, we're allowed to assume that because, well, we've already shown preservation of that quantity. And, and it suffices to, to check it's true at the very, the very edge, the very edge of this psi two equals zero uh, constraint. So it suffices to assume that, that psi one is less than or equal to zero. And it suffices to assume that delta times lambda three is equal to lambda one plus lambda two. Well, we're going to split into cases. What I want to do is eliminate delta from this expression by doing delta equals lambda one plus lambda two on lambda three. Of course, first we have to exclude the, 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 the silly case that we already assume uh, that lambda three is equal to zero. But you, you can exclude this case for, for a number of reasons. If lambda three is equal to zero, the fact that Ricci curvature is is non-negative implies that all of your all of your sectional uh, it implies that all of your sectional curvatures are zero. So there's nothing really to explain here. Alternatively, you can just get rid of this term and this term uh, and see that well, clearly this term is going to dominate this term here, I think, uh, and and so everything works out. So on the other hand, if lambda three is not equal to zero, we're going to <laughs> Just do, doing, do, we're going to do some algebra at this point. So as I said, we're going to eliminate delta and replace it with lambda three times lambda one plus lambda two. Um, we're going to take out a lambda three from this expression here and put it back. Uh, what you may notice uh, is that this term cancels with this term here. And then what you're left with is this term. And this term, I think, Yep, and what you end up with is, is this expression here. Now this expression is also going to be less than or equal to zero. And the reason for that is again, the fact that lambda, lambda one and lambda two uh, are less than or equal to lambda three. So you can replace this with lambda three, no drama, replace this with lambda three, no drama, and everything cancels out and you're happy. Okay, so this was psi two. So we now know that psi one and psi two being less than or equal to zero are preserved under the ODEs. An immediate, well, being careful with your application of the tensor maximum principle as before, what you can then infer is that if there happens to be an epsilon uh, between zero and a third, so that the Ricci curvature is bigger than epsilon times the scalar curvature, scalar curvature, scalar curvature times GT, that is also going to be preserved. And I'll just point out again uh, where, this, where this one third came from. It doesn't really make sense to have uh, epsilon being anything bigger than one third, because remember the, re the, the lowest Ricci curvature eigenvalue is lambda one plus lambda two. Scalar curvature is going to be twice, maybe I'll relabel re that, twice times lambda one plus lambda two plus lambda three. 
So again, it doesn't make sense for epsilon to be anything bigger than a third because then you start contradicting your, your sequence, your, your, your assumed ordering of your eigenvalues. Now, I've got, a, got another question for the audience. My, my claim for you is that knowing this is better than knowing this. Why is that? Or at least make, make me right. Explain why I might be right when I say uh, that this condition is better than the first one. Why is it better knowing that psi two is less than or equal to zero is a better condition? It depends on your moral values, right? It certainly does. <laughs> <laughs> why might I say that, do you think? I get in general it's not right, but in for Richie flow. Yeah, I guess so. So I guess okay. I guess I need to exp I need to explain why I think it's better now because <laughs> people seem to not be agreeing with me. So I, I claim it's better because this is a this is a scale invariant inequality, whereas this one is not. And so the the, the aim is uh, of course to to get closer and closer to the singularity. Uh, what we're going to do is rescale. But of course, near a singularity, we would expect the Ricci curvature to be quite large. And so the fact that it's quite large doesn't mean anything when you rescale. This condition, on the other hand, does, uh, does not become worse when you rescale close to the singularity. And so when you're rescaling close to the singularity, you'd expect this, uh, this inequality here to possibly be more, more useful for you. So uh, hopefully I've... <laughs> Hopefully I've justified, hopefully I've justified my position there. Of course, knowing that knowing the first inequality is preserved is, is useful to establish blow up in the first in the first place. Uh, but this this comes in much more handy when you're trying to uh, trying to understand what the singularity looks like. Um, Tim, can, can you preserve positive lower bounds for us? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, you can. Uh, that's so remember the the evolution for the scalar curvature is uh, just given by, uh, well, something like the diffusion plus twice the Ricci curvature squared. And of course, this, this, uh, this term has a sign. And so usually you're good uh, when it comes to establishing lower bounds for the scalar curvature. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thanks, perfect. Okay, cool. Yep. All right. So now, uh, I'll, I'll I'll have some time to get through. Sorry, Tim. One more. Oh, yeah. This, this is kind of naive, but uh, if epsilon was to equal one third, then we're in the Einstein case, right? Yes. That that's right. S, so S over n g is right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's right. Okay. So I think. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So. So th this is very this is very suggestive notation here because yes. <laughs> what we're aiming to do is is to point out that if you're not the sphere, then you know you might get pretty close to the upper upper side mm -hmm. of this uh, of this bracket here and get yes. yeah in the limit you'd expect to get something that's Einstein. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Yeah, so I guess the only time if you set epsilon equals a third, that means you're saying that this this inequality is true everywhere across the whole manifold, which means that you're already the sphere. So there's nothing interesting, nothing interesting to study there. Okay. So the, the last theorem, uh, my, my understanding is that this does actually get us quite close to proving Hamilton's original theorem. What is missing, however, is, is appropriate uh, convergence theory for Ramanian manifolds. It, it's been, mentioned a number of times now that we need to do this at some point, and I'm going to say it well as well, we need to do this at some point, but it might not be me who does it. So let's have a look at this theorem. What, what are we saying here? So pick, choose an initial Ramanian metric, pick B sir and B, which are going to be uh, upper and lower bounds for your Ricci curvature at initial time. Then for any small lambda greater than or equal to, so greater than zero, there is going to be an M, probably pretty large, 
uh, pretty large m greater than or equal to zero so that this, this inequality is preserved as you go along the Ricci flow. Now, but before I get into the proof, because I probably won't have time to finish the, the whole proof off, we'll, we'll see how we go. But I want to point out why this theorem uh, becomes so important when you're trying to establish uh, good, good theory for singularities of solutions to the Ricci flow, which have positive, positive Ricci curvature. And I guess it all, it all comes down to the scaling. You pick, you pick a lambda, you, know, you, you choose a small lambda, you pick a really, really large M, and you get this inequality. And what you're going to do is rescale, uh, you're going to rescale next, you're going to rescale as you get closer and closer to the singularity. These terms here have the same scale, whereas this, is just a constant, it does not have the same scale. So when you rescale, M is going to get, well, once you rescale, this term is going to vanish. And what you end up with is this uh, is less than or equal to lambda times the scale of curvature. And at this point, so, so we know that what, whatever our singularity model is, it's going to satisfy this inequality here. But then you say, ah, oh, but remember I said uh, gamma was arbitrary initially. So therefore, uh, it also has to be less than or equal to zero. And therefore, our singularity model is going to be Einstein. Several details there that I have overlooked. Uh, but this, I guess, is the idea behind establishing roundness of our singularities. Uh, um, I expect people you... have comments. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Would you need a S of GT over three in the left-hand side? If your claim is that that's going to be zero? Maybe I do. Yes, pro uh, let's see, probably. Yeah, yeah, that, that'd be right because, okay. yep. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, that, it'd have to be that. Yeah, because Ricci curvature is going to be twice, two times the, the Riemann curvature eigenvalues, whereas the scalar curvature is going to be six times the Riemann curvature eigenvalue. So yeah, I guess you do need that three there. Yeah, the trace of G is three in this case. So otherwise oh. this, up, this doesn't have to be zero. So it's going to be zero. So it's fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, cool, thank you. Yeah, cool. Okay. So uh, to, to prove this particular result, we're going to keep track of the psi one and psi two that we already have. We're, going, we're also going to introduce a psi three, uh, which is the one which is basically the, this is the, I, I guess you can think about this as the, the actual pinching quantity, because here we've got, well, well, psi three, this is the difference, the difference of the, the largest difference between the two, uh, the largest difference in eigenvalues, and in order to establish a result like rounding, what we really want is for this quantity to be quite small. Um, it turns out that, well, at least the way Topping did it, you, you, it's difficult to do this straight out, but instead you need to offset it <laughs> with, with this particular term here, uh, minus a times the, the smallest Ricci curvature eigenvalue raised to the power of theta, and it becomes quite important that theta is less than one. So these are the quantities we're going to be dealing with. Clearly the strategy is to show that uh, preservation of all of these quantities for i is equal to one, two, three, uh, this is something that is preserved under the Ricci flow and that'll get us close to, to what we want to establish. Okay. But first, maybe we should just point out that these are actually less than or equal to zero at initial time. Well, psi one is uh, <laughs> psi one is less is less than or equal to zero because uh, the Ricci curvature is greater than or equal to b sub g naught. That's what we said initially. Uh, remember, psi two being less than or equal to zero is equivalent to Ricci curvature being greater than or equal to epsilon times the scalar curvature of g naught times times g naught. Uh, in this case, our epsilon comes from taking beta 
on three times B. So uh, where does that come from? So remember, remember we said that Bisa was less than or equal to Ricci, which was less than or equal to B. So remember this, this lower bound is saying lambda one plus lambda two is greater than Bisa. And the upper bound comes from observing that lambda two plus lambda three is less than or equal to B. Um, you make some, well, well you, you, you include some lambda ones in here, do some rearranging. And what you can do is establish, establish this, uh, this lower bound here. And the final one, uh, so as I said before, theta is going to be this expression here. Given theta is fixed, you'll always, you'll always just be able to make a large to ensure that psi three is less than or equal to zero. So I guess we're, we're playing some games here because we're saying, well, theta is fixed, but we can make a large enough so that this works out. Now, before I get into, uh, before I get into establishing that these conditions are preserved, I want to point out why preservation of these inequalities is useful. So as before, just spelling out what all these quantities are again, um, if we happen to know that these, the, these, the, the negativity of these inequalities is preserved under the Ricci flow, what we're going to do uh, is the following computation. Ah, oh, good. It was just the statement of the theorem that <laughs> I forgot to include the factor of a three. I was quite worried that my proof was very, very wrong, but it's not very, very wrong. So difference of difference of, well, to just expand the brackets here. What you end up with is, is this, uh, this inequality here. Cool, thanks James, see you around. Uh, what we get is this, this equality here. Now, what, what can we do with this? Well, remember the, the, largest, the largest eigenvalue of the Ricci curvature is going to be lambda two plus lambda three squared. Um, and the scalar curvature is going to be, uh, remember it's going to be two times lambda one plus lambda two plus lambda three. Uh, that is all squared on three. Uh, there is a bit of rearranging to do, but what you can do is use the fact that psi one and psi two is less than or equal to zero uh, to establish that this, this expression is actually less than or equal to the square of the biggest difference in, in eigenvalues. I guess that makes intuitive sense because this expression is clearly measuring how, how close to round our metric is. And this expression is measuring how different the, the eigenvalues are. So I guess it's natural to expect that we should get something like that. Now we use the, the, the negativity of psi three to control this in terms of the lowest eigenvalue of the Ricci curvature. Uh, but remember, of course, well, well, clearly, clearly the lowest eigenvalue of the Ricci curvature can be controlled in terms of the scalar curvature, possibly at the expense of changing, changing this constant. And so, well, that, 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 that's more or less the result. So what we can do is say, well, this is less than or equal to uh, a tilde squared times the scalar curvature raised to the power of two theta. If we take the square root, what we're going to get is this expression here where m is chosen to be the supremum of this expression over positive s. This is where it becomes quite important that theta is in fact less than one. So this is why, this is why knowing uh, preservation of the inequalities is useful, useful for us. Now, I guess I'll, I'll finish off the proof by pointing out why we do get in a, why we do get preservation of negativity of psi three. So just remember what the quantities are, what the ODEs are. Now, it turns out to be more, instead of directly uh, computing the derivative of this, it turns out to be more useful to compute the derivative of the logarithm of the ratio, because clearly it would suffice to show that uh, this derivative is less than or equal to zero whenever this is less than one, I think, yes. And so of course we can use the, the good log rules of derivatives. What we end up with is this. So this is just 
the derivative of lambda three minus lambda one. Um, there was some cancellation of squares that's going on here. So remember lambda three gives us uh, lambda, uh, so what have we got here? Um, lambda three squared. Oh, that's right, yes, sorry, my bad. So what we're going to get here, this is going to be equal to the derivative of ln of lambda three minus lambda one on dt. Uh, so this is just going to be uh, lambda three minus lambda one on bottom times lambda three dot minus lambda one. There's, you, you collect terms, factorize, and you end up with this expression here. And a similar deal for the second term. The second term, the theta just comes out the front because of our logarithm rules. Find an expression for the derivative and what we end up with is this expression here. Okay, and I guess what happens to conclude, we say, well, we're allowed to assume that psi two is less than or equal to zero. And so that gives us an opportunity to, uh, well, use, uh, use, use this expression here. Uh, what we end up with, well, I guess what we want to do here, it seems like what I've done here is I've factorized lambda three minus lambda two plus lambda one out the front of everything. Um, the way you do that, I believe, is you take this two lambda two squared um, I think you say it's less than, or clearly this is less than or equal to two times lambda three squared, and then you use this expression, I think, is that right? Uh, I might be jumbling up some of the computations here. Maybe I'll have to do this in a bit more detail next time. But in any case, what we end up with is this expression here. And of course, uh, remembering how theta was defined, uh, theta was defined to be, well, precisely one divided by this, one divided by one plus delta on two. And we end up with zero and we get preservation of the, uh, of the required inequalities. All right, I, I think I'll leave that there. Quite happy to take questions, of course. So thanks for your attendance. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, any, anyone got some questions? Oh, yeah, we should clap here, sorry, I gotta clap. Apologies, Tim. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Very good. So how far from uh, Hamilton's theorem are we assuming? What do we need? Some more regularity? And, uh, uh, yeah, I think yeah. it's the, the, the theory, the compactness theory. We, right, we need, need to, well, convergence. We, we yeah. need we need machinery yeah. to take limits, and I, I think yeah. that's basically all we're missing at yeah. this point now. Yeah. I think you can actually bypass that um, if you use some there's some other theory, like if you're close to an Einstein metric, then you are a space form or something. Um, um, if I'm remembering right, this was from Bandler's uh, course. Okay. Um, yeah, right. It's like a stability result or something, maybe Some, something like that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, I yeah, think I guess he did it. He, he skipped all the compactness theory to prove Hamilton's result, and then he did the, the compactness theory. Yep. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Right. Yeah. In either in either case, I guess it's still <laughs> look, yeah looking at the dynamical stability of of the sphere under the Ricci flow, I guess is. Yeah, because I guess actually that, that's another way you could do it. Was that just a normalized Ricci flow argument? Yeah, I mean, use this, this pinching thing, right? Uh, to show that you're pinching towards an Einstein metric. And then somehow there's some theorem that I think is possibly quite deep that you can, uh, you can argue that when you're close to an Einstein metric uh, of positive scalar curvature, then you're a sphere or something. Um, In three dimensions. In three dimensions, yeah. Right. So it's a slightly stronger, uh, bit more than stability. It's sort of rigidity that anything yeah. nearby. There's a gap, a uh, kind of gap theorem, sort of. Yeah. Uh, but don't quote me on that. I'll have to look it up properly. Um. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't looked closely at, at the notes either, actually. There's still some work to show you get nearby in the sense because you have to show. Here it says if the curvature is large, then in that region it's pinched. But uh, you yeah. still would need to show that it gets pinched everywhere. Yeah, that's true. So you can make a gradient estimate or something. Yeah. Um, but doesn't that, 
I, okay, I guess it doesn't follow automatically just from the scale of curvature inequalities you've got. I mean, you have to use compactness at some point. All right, very good. Uh, does anyone have any other questions that are slightly uh, less vague than mine? <laughs> More educated? Uh, right, that's a uh, that's a low standard we've set there for, for educated questions. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just kidding. All right, well, thanks everybody. Um, I guess uh, Tim's going to continue next week. What's uh, what do we have planned for next week, Tim? Well, I think my plan for the moment was to go through some of the good examples in the um, in the Chow Ricci right. flow book on That's how this breaks down in any dimension bigger than <laughs> yeah. in any dimension bigger than three. There are lots and lots of well, people have made careers out of <laughs> constructing counterexamples to these sorts of things. So I thought it might be interesting to go through some of those. Just, just in case anyone had any naive uh, expectation that this would <laughs> this should work in all dimensions. Well, in some sense, it does, right? But not for proving. Uh, well, you know, yeah, depending on gotta, how you generalize. Yeah, the problem is all of Ben wrote a book on this, right? So all of the curvature <laughs> conditions are more or less the same in three dimensions, but as soon as you go higher, you get lots of different possible curvatures right. you need to keep track of. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, I think I think Hamilton Ivy pinching is one that doesn't really admit a good generalization to higher dimensions without already assuming. Like the good thing about Hamilton Ivy pinching is that it works even without assuming any curvature positivity. Um, most most other well, and this is something I believe is quite unique to to three dimensions. There's not really a good generalization of Hamilton Ivy pinching in higher dimensions. I don't think. There's some pinching with assuming two positive. Yeah. If you but, if you already I mean, this make is three positive, which is slightly better. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, are we are we assuming positive scalar curvature here? Maybe. Maybe not, right? Well, if you don't assume positive scalar curvature, then Hamilton Ivy pinching isn't really saying anything. Right. So yeah. I don't think. That's fine. So, yeah, okay, fine. Three, three positive. <laughs> yeah, you got me. All right, very good. Um, that seems like a good point to, uh, to stop then. All right, cool. Uh, stop recording. Yeah, let's thank Tim again. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. See you next week. Thanks, guys.